Richard Skipper celebrates. Every show is a celebration. Each show, Richard delivers the artists you love, showcasing what makes them unique. Never gossipy. The antidote to a sometimes hectic world. Now, here's your host, Richard Skipper. Happy holidays, everyone, and welcome to the latest edition of Richard Skipper Celebrates. This is the show in which I celebrate artists and their body of worth. And artists come in all shapes and sizes. Uh, some artists we know right on stage. We see them there when we go to the theater. But there are many artists that are behind the scenes. They're the framework, according to... Uh, to Susan Shulman's book. And that's Susan L. Shulman. It's not Susan with an H or Susan with a K. It's Susan with an L. Uh, so everyone get to know that. Susan, it's so good to see you here. Uh, you and I have known each other uh, probably forever. At, uh, at forever. I think at least 25 years. Probably. Uh, you know, today marks 282 days since our theaters shut down. And of course, that's our life, Brett. That's our yeah. lifeline. Uh, I want to ask how you're really doing in the midst of this crazy world that we find ourselves in. Uh, it's actually tough. I mean, it's tough for everybody. I, I, I'm not starving. I have a roof over my head. You know, I'm okay. But I feel terrible for all the people that have that are in trouble and have lost their livelihoods. And it's not just the actors and the musicians and the stagehands, but it's the cobblers and it's the people that dry clean the clothes. And it, it's just everybody that it, it, the restaurants, the taxi drivers, it's it, the loss of the theater is so um, far reaching. And, and it's tough. I, I mean, I just can't wait till we all get vaccinated and can go back and be a community again. Absolutely. Well, the amazing thing is that we are still a community. That will not leave us. Uh, and so many people, such as myself and what you're doing right now, we're connecting uh, through this new world of virtual media. Um, has this been something that's been easy for you to adjust to, or have, <laughs> or have you been resisting it? Well, as Richard knows, we had a little trouble connecting just now. So, <laughs> by the way, I like, I think that we should all have that swirly star effect. Uh, anytime we're we're on a, a a Zoom call or something, could you could you arrange that? You mean the curtains that are behind me? No, no. At the very beginning, you have a kind of oh. whirly, starry thing. I like I like that. Please, I think that effect would be very uh, enhancing. Susan, you and I have known each other a, no, a long time. You know that that precedes me every time I walk into a room. Little sparkle. <laughs> <laughs> At least I want to throw it all around when I go. And in why there. not? Why not? So, um, what did your calendar look like uh, prior to March 11th when everything shut down? Well, it. I had lots of lots of projects. I have two or three shows that are what I call maybes. You know, that are we we hope and pray that they're going to be real. But you know, maybe they don't have all their money, or maybe they don't have their stars yet, or whatever. So I had a few maybes hovering. And I was also doing some cabaret work. I worked with Deborah Grace Weiner, and she had several projects coming up in, at um, Birdland. And, you know, um, and I have the actors that I work with, of course, including, as you know, Karen Ziemba, uh, the wonderful Karen Ziemba. Uh, so, you know, there were lots of things sort of percolating. And then there were not, then there was nothing, you know, and it's tough. Well, you know what, I one of my the, uh, earlier interviews, I started doing this in March, uh, was the incredible Donna McKechnie, and who I know you've worked with. I love and, Donna. Uh, Donna, loves Donna. Uh, Donna made uh, you know a great observation that I agree with. She said that she believes that those of us who are in the arts have a greater grasp on what's happening than the average person who has uh, an let's say a nine to five job, mm -hmm. uh, because we're used to being be, uh, between gigs. Hills uh, and valleys, as we say. Hills and valleys. And you also uh, talk uh, about uh, the fact that uh, there are so many uh, different uh, paths, detours that we take. And there are also those ifs, maybes that yeah. are out there. Yeah. And um, our lives are made up of a lot of ifs and maybes. Yes, and I think that's probably very, uh, very perceptive of Donna because 
the truth is that, for instance, actors always find side gigs. And I mean, sadly, that's dried up too. all those, you know, cater waiter jobs and things. But what I'm very impressed with is the resourcefulness. I have one friend who um, figured out how to uh, transfer uh, like VHS tapes to thumb drives. Wow. Ian Knauer. Yeah. And he figured out the technology and he started to do it as a side gig. And uh, people love it. You know, everybody's got old VHS tapes that we don't know what to do with or we don't have anything to play it on. And so, you know, people are selling things on, on Etsy. People are finding, I, was it uh, Robbie uh, Fairchild, I heard, has, has opened a um, florist business. You know, this wonderful dancer. Uh, you know, yes. And uh, I think it was Spectrum actually did a profile on uh, his work and everything. Yeah, so, and I mean, because creative people are creative people. And so they are figuring out ways to at least survive, if not prosper, you know, uh, but it's tough. I mean, I, I really feel for everybody. This is a tough time. And also, we're all people that, you know, have a to do list, you know, when we wake up when we, before we hit the feet hit the floor, you know, we all have things that we need to accomplish. And to kind of at the end of the deal, at the end of the day, feel like you haven't accomplished anything is a little weird. Well, what is a typical day like for you right now? Or is there <laughs> any such thing as a typical day? No. And, and that's, I, I wish there were, I mean, I, I feel a, a bit of adrift, you know, a, a bit unstructured. Um, I, I have a daily Skype with a friend of mine who I think is watching today. And she and I, at the, we decided we needed to be accountable to each other, that we needed to be able at the end of the day, say I did X, Y, and Z. And, and sometimes it's a struggle to come up with a list, you know, well, I, uh, emptied the waste paper basket. <laughs> <laughs> That's an accomplishment. Uh, yes, it is. It's not a big accomplishment. <laughs> but you know, well, it depends on how long that uh, waste paper basket. How is. many waste paper baskets you have. <laughs> yes, it, the, everything's, everything's, uh, yes. Um, but, you know, some days it's a struggle to come up with that list. It's not, not very productive. Well, of course, we're here to also talk about this incredible book. Uh, as you can see, I've got my notes and things. In Iron here. Ironically, I have a copy too. Oh, but good. That's because I'm a press agent. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to, you know, it's so funny. I was thinking, where do we start with this? Because my shows are all about celebrating. Uh, I want to celebrate you. And I want everyone to get a chance to know who you are, what you're all about, how you tick, um, and how you have navigated this phenomenal career that you've had. Mm -hmm. And I want to start with where your book starts. In the book, you talk about uh, coming out of the stage door of the Palace Theater uh, at uh, during applause and a man walking up to you and saying, are you anybody? And I laughed out loud because I don't know if you remember this and some people may know what I'm referring to. There used to be a man who used to hang out outside of Sardi's. And That's who it was. The, that guy. Same guy. The same guy who said, are you anybody? Are you anybody? And I came out of Sardi's once. And as I was walking out the door, he, he said, are you anybody? And I stopped and I said, you don't know who I am. <laughs> and that really blew his mind. And he's Good looking for me, you. Who, who are you? Who are you? I'm going, you know who I am. Otherwise, you wouldn't be asking me if I'm anybody. And as I walked, you know, <laughs> toward Ninth Avenue, he was like, this man was like, oh, my God, what just happened? Right. And, and, I, and I missed it. Whoever he <laughs> was. I missed it. Well, th there was this guy who used to stand outside stage doors and, uh, and say, are you anybody? Because he wanted to see if you were um, worthy of getting an autograph of. That's not English, but it, you know, yes, worthy of getting an autograph. And yeah. and I and I remember thinking at the time, and I was this little kid, you know, I was like twenty two or something, and and I and I certainly was not anybody. But I remember thinking, boy, that's a real ego buster, isn't it? You know, are you anybody? But you also mentioned in the book, which I loved, is that, that as a kid, uh, I think you and your friend went to see The King and I. That was the first show that you saw without your parents with you, right? No adults. No adults, and uh, you want to stay outside the stage door to meet the stars, not for autographs, not for photos. In those days, we didn't have our cameras with us all the time. No. But you stood there because you wanted to tell them how much you enjoyed their work. 
I wanted to tell them how they enhanced my life. And I didn't, I really didn't care about getting their autograph at all. I mean, I wanted to meet them. I wanted to talk to them. And of course, what actor doesn't want to be told that you've enhanced somebody's life, you know, and especially somebody who was obviously sincere. I wasn't, you know, I didn't have an agenda or anything. I was a little kid. And um, amazingly, not only would people talk to me, but sometimes they would invite me backstage and they would, you know, be, correspond with me. And, you know, I mean, it was amazing. And of course, I assumed that everybody in the theater was that nice. You know, imagine my surprise later on when I found out it wasn't 100 percent. But but I mean, people really were very kind and generous to this little kid who was just a, a fan, you know, and that's exactly how my relationship with Mary Martin started, too. I was a fan and I saw Sound of Music and I wrote her a fan letter and she answered. And then I wrote her another fan letter and she answered and I wrote another fan letter and said, I'm coming to see the show again. Could I meet you? And she said, yes. And that became that turned into a sort of life lifelong sort of fan star relationship. And uh, later I found out she did this with many, many people. In fact, the person that edited my book, Fran Weil, was one of them, which we discovered many years later. But it was I mean, I was sincere. I wasn't, as I said, I didn't have any axe to grind. I just adored her, you know, and and the. Uh, should I tell my Mary Martin story about? I would love to hear your Mary Martin. Um, full circle. Yes. So, so this went on for years and years and years, and I would see her at things, and she was always very nice to me and very generous and kind, and gave me opening night tickets for some for I do I do. I mean, she was wonderful to me, and I was just a fan. I mean, I, you know, that's all it was. And years later, I was a grown up press agent, and I had a show that was coming to the Kennedy Center that was following a play that she was in. It was after she had retired, after her husband died, and she hadn't been on Broadway for 10 years. And she came back in a play called Do You Turn Somersaults? And Do You Turn Somersaults was playing at the Kennedy Center prior to the play I was press agent for, which was called The Merchant, which was the play Zero Mustel died during, which was not a good thing. Um, it is. No. When the star dies, you really shouldn't go on with the play. But <laughs> yes. We did. But anyway, so... So the press agent at the Kennedy Center knew that I was, I had told him that I had this crush on Mary Martin, so to speak, fan crush. And he said, well, come down on this particular day. She's do, she and Anthony Quayle, her co-star, are doing a live radio interview from the Kennedy Center. And you could come to that and then see the show that night. And I thought, that sounds good. So I went to the live broadcast. And during the course of the broadcast, somebody, they took questions from the audience, all live. It was a national radio show. Mm -hmm. And somebody got up and she said, well, I saw the show and I thought it was a jip because you didn't sing. It was a straight play, mm -hmm. by the way. Of course. Yeah. So Mary explained very intelligently. I thought it was so interesting. She talked about how the character she played um, was a was she was like an old circus performer or something. And in the play originally, she was remembering her past and she performed a song that she used to sing. And she said the audience was applauding Mary Martin and it was taking them out of the play. Mm -hmm. And so the decision was made to have the character sing half the song and then be kind of overcome with memories and not finish the song, which I thought was really interesting. I and agree. Absolutely. I thought that was really so, you know, it was just an interesting insight. And this woman who was kind of a dope said, well, I don't care. I thought it was a jip. And I was horrified because you don't insult Mary Martin in front of me. <laughs> no, Peter Pan. No, of course not. That's not okay. And so I, the next time they had, uh, they took questions from the audience. I went up to the mic and I said, "Well, on behalf of everyone, I would how thrilled we. I just wanted to say how thrilled we were that she was back on the stage and that we didn't care if she read the phone book. That we were very happy that she was back. And both she and Anthony Quill." sort of acknowledged uh, uh, without words that I had kind of saved a very awkward moment on live radio and they both kind of went, you know, and so, which was lovely. And afterwards the, the Kennedy center press agent said, come, come say hello to Mary. And I said, she doesn't know who I am. I mean, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm somebody she writes to once, once every 10 years. And he said, come on. 
And so he sort of dragged me over there and I was kind of embarrassed. And he said, and before I could open my mouth, she said to me, thank you very much. You really saved our bacon. And I said, well, you won't remember me, but we used to be pen pals. I, my name is Susan Schulman. And she said, I know exactly who you are. And, and I said, well, I'm seeing the show tonight. And she said, well, come back afterwards and we'll talk then. And so after the show, I went back and we sat in her dressing room for an hour. Uh, I showed her how I could sign, sign her autograph, which is something you do when you're 13 years old and, you know, starstruck. And she said, where were you during that damn book tour? You know, and, <laughs> and we wound up sitting as two professionals in the theater. One, obviously, up there and one. But it was a... a, a you know, like a miracle, sort of. And afterwards, we walked out of the stage door, and there were people standing outside waiting for her. And I, it, inside, I was them, you know. And I thought to myself afterwards, how amazingly lucky was I to have a chance to pay back? Because, you know, it's very unusual that you would ever have a chance to, in some little, small, unimportant way, pay back all the favors that she did all the kindnesses that she did to me as a kid. And wasn't that, I mean, I still get choked up. What a gift that was to me. It's to be an able amazing gift. And there are so many layers to this story that you're telling us. Um, when you're in the spotlight, and we will talk about that aspect of your life in a few moments, but when you're dealing with people that are in the spotlight, um, there are fans, and of course, mm -hmm. I mean rabid fans, mm -hmm. and there are people that follow some stars uh, from theater to theater to theater. They show up at every uh, matinee yep. uh, waiting to see them as they leave the theater. And these fans begin to feel that these people on the stage owe them something. And, Sometimes, yes. And, you know, my point of view is the only thing they owe any of us is a great performance. You buy your tickets, you go to the theater, they give a performance. And of course, now, especially with this new world that we live in, um, that's not that's going to be uh, not allowed, that fans will be yeah. waiting outside the stage door. Uh, you, have you ever had to deal uh, in your profession uh, on, as a press agent with... Uh, crazy fans in the stars? A little bit, yeah. I mean, not too much. It, it's more sometimes uh, uh, when I'm handling an individual actor, actor, actress as a personal, you know, individual press agent rather than handling the show, sometimes I will help them with their mail, fan mail and stuff like that. And occasionally you get, you know, people that are a little, you know, over the top and and um, not scary, but a, a, a perhaps presumptu presumptuous, is, is that a word? Um, you know, assuming assuming a familiarity that isn't real. And so you have to be kind of careful about that. You know, there's a certain amount of letters from prison to, you know, there's, there's yeah. that. But well, there was a great book that came out uh, in the late 70s called The Fan. Uh, Lauren Bacall, who you've worked with, uh, starred in the movie. Right. Mm -hmm. And if anyone's ever read this book, I love the book. I read it in high school. And it, it's all fan letters. And the fan letters oh. start out loving the star. And then cycle, this person turns. But I'll tell you a funny story, and then we're going to get back to you. But years <laughs> uh, later, I'm in New York, and I'm with a friend, and we were invited to a dinner. And we go to this apartment and the fan is on the bookshelf in every language that you could possibly imagine. <laughs> and I said stupidly uh, in my very young self, oh, you must be a big fan of this book. The of fan. the fan, yeah. And he said, yes, I wrote it. <laughs> and I was having dinner with Bob Randall who wrote the book. How funny. We were able to discuss it. And afterwards, I'll tell you the story, you know, because there are so many great stories around that movie and everything. But I want to go, uh, back to Susan L. Shulman. And I want to begin by, uh, have, is it driven you crazy uh, of the Susan L. Shulman and the Susan K. Shulman? It's and Susan F, L, and H, actually. There's three of us. And we're all about the same age and we're all kind of the same type and we've all been doing it about the same time. So we have always, all, always gotten messages and mail and stuff. And my my joke about it is that I can always tell when I'm introduced to someone if they think I'm either the one is a literary agent and one is a director. 
And they're, thank goodness, none of us is a lox. You know, we're all reasonably good at what we do. So, you know, that's good. But the way I can tell if I'm introduced to someone, if, if, they, th if they think I'm one of the other two, is if they're absolutely thrilled. If someone says, oh, I'd like you to meet Susan Shulman, and they go, oh, then either it's an actor who <laughs> thinks I'm the director, or it's a writer or playwright who thinks I'm the literary agent. That's how I can tell. And then I have to make that split second decision as to whether clarifying it is important or not. You know, I, I don't want to embarrass somebody and make them feel silly. On the other hand, you know, I don't want them to assume something that's wrong, but there's sometimes it doesn't matter. You know, it just doesn't matter. And, but I always laugh because for years we've all gotten each other's packages. And at one point we had the same mailman. We were, we all were so close together that we had the same mailman. So we'd say, no, that's the one on 44th street. No, that's the one. On 44th street. <laughs> well, at least you all know each other. And that's we, we've, we've all known each other for years. In fact, I saw, the director not too long ago we were at a uh, there's something called broadway selects which is where they honor the worker bees in the theater for their years of work and um we were sitting next to each other at something and we were laughing because it's like are we confusing people <laughs> you know? i think you should have an exclusive club or something uh, you should do a program together years, and years ago we were at some event and i said to the photographer take this picture i can if i can't place this picture I'm not worth anything as a press agent. And it ran in Playbill. It ran a lot of places <laughs> to prove that there really are three of us. Now, Susan, you belong to a very exclusive club um, of people in the theater. And that really? club is that you were born in New York. You're a native yeah. New Yorker. You grew up here. You grew up on the Upper West Side. Um, still there. You're still there. And uh, I mean, where are you in proximity to where you grew up? I live, I have lived... People who don't live in New York will find this statement very weird. But if you live in New York, you won't find it weird at all. I have lived my entire life within a 13 block radius. But in New York, there's something called, you know, rent stabilization and rent control. And so if you find a good apartment, you pretty much stay there. And I did. So how long have you been where you are now? I've been in this building since 1970. Oh, and your career was just starting to take off at that. Uh, point. 1970 was a big year. Applause. Uh, absolutely. Sure. By the way, when you talk about uh, the fan, when I, as I'm sure you're going to talk about, uh, my my first important show was Applause uh, with Lauren Bacall, and it was thanks to Lauren Bacall that I was the press agent for it. But I remember she was she was you know she was prickly. She was lovely to me, but she was you know she could be tough, and people would come up to her at a restaurant and say, I'm so sorry to interrupt your dinner. And she'd look at them and she'd say, and yet you are. <laughs> <laughs> I was lucky enough to have breakfast with her once. And a woman walked up to her. And, um, uh, her book now had just come out, which was the sequel to her first book. Yep. And uh, this woman walked up and said, would you sign this to the greatest mother in the world? And she said, oh, you knew my mom. <laughs> And the woman says, no, I mean, my mom. Yeah. He said, uh, no, I will not sign this book to uh, the greatest mother in the world because we're going to argue on this subject. She did not suffer fools gladly. Said, Would you please do this? And the woman said, no. And I mean, uh, Lauren McCall said, no. And she did it again. And finally, she just said, please go away. Yeah. You know? And that was the end of it. <laughs> but I mean, you know, if, if people don't realize that. I mean, people say terrible things sometimes, and they and they don't mean it. You know, they 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 think they're being complimentary, but it's partly because they're they're in the presence of somebody they admire, and they get a little mm -hmm. flustered and a little stupid. But you know, she would be out for dinner with a date, Bacall, mm -hmm. and someone would come up to her and say, "Oh, that bogey! Now there was a man," and you'd think, "There's a guy sitting here." You know, what does that do to his ego? You know. I mean, it, it, people don't realize it, and they don't mean it in in that way. But when you're Goldberg once said that if she was eating alone in a restaurant and somebody wanted to come over and converse with her, she welcomes them with open arms. But she said, if I'm with someone, don't do that because you don't know the purpose of our dinner meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, we could be discussing a death in the family. We could be discussing a big business deal, and you know, and I, I, but I'm not that person anyway. I can't imagine going over to someone's table, you know, and uh, interrupting yeah. a dinner of somebody that I don't know. Yeah. 
Well, the thing the thing that I that that made a big impression upon me when I worked with Bacall was that you're always on. There's always somebody looking at you. There's always somebody watching, you know, and you can't kind of scratch and, you know, <laughs> like a normal person. Right, you know, exactly. Because there's always somebody watching. And I remember, as, and I was, a, as I said, I was a kid and thinking, God, you know, that's tough. That's, you know, I'll, I'll protect somebody like that because <laughs> I think that's really hard. You know, it's wonderful to be famous and rich and successful and have everybody applauding for you. But there's a flip side and you don't often see it. And I did get to see it with her for the first time. And I remember thinking, boy, it ain't all glamour, is it? You know, this is this isn't so much fun to have this part of your life to have to navigate through that. And I think that is partially why she was kind of snarky with some people, although she wasn't snarky with people she knew. She was snarky with people she didn't know. Well, Meryl Streep once said that the one thing that she missed the most about being famous was being able to sit in a coffee shop and observing people. Yeah. Because now everyone's observing her. Yeah. And I think that is hard. And I and it does color your the way you go through life, I would imagine. You know? Now, again, go, getting back to your childhood, I always like to go back to the five-year-old self because that's to me, the most authentic that a person is. Uh, you're starting yeah. to develop into being who you uh -huh. are. Uh -huh. Before you start school, mm -hmm. it's before all the layers of uh, peer pressure and everything are placed upon you. And yeah. you talk about your childhood in your book and your mom and your dad and this wonderful, idyllic uh, growing up in New York. I mean, especially now with the, you know, let's, forget the pandemic for a moment if we can. Uh, this time of year growing up and the holidays and the store windows and everything, uh, mm -hmm. take all of us back uh, to the five-year-old. <laughs> no, not that far back, but- uh, and The page is flipping. You know, and you're beginning to be aware of the theater. Well, my parents were also New Yorkers. They also both grew up in New York. They were, um, they're, their parents also grew up. I'm third generation born in America. Um, fourth generation is not. But so so my parents were didn't have any money and but they they were very enamored with the theater, didn't know anything you know about it, but they just loved it. And they would go to a there was a place, I think it was called Gray's, where people could get tickets for 55 cents. It was like the 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 precursor to um the tick booth. Mm -hmm. And so they would go downtown and this was, you know, like during the depression, they didn't have any money. They went down, they'd buy tickets for 55 cents and they'd go see a show and sitting in the last row of the balcony. And then they would go to Needix and have dinner. Do you want to tell them how much those tickets were? <laughs> 55 cents. Yes. <laughs> 55 cents It was the story. And so for like a dollar, they had a night on the town, a dollar, two dollars, you know, dollar each. So, so they always went to the theater. And so when I was a kid, I would see them getting all dressed up and maybe by this time they had, they were buying more expensive tickets, but it was still upstairs in the balcony, you know, and I always thought how glamorous that was, you know, they'd get all dolled up and they smelled good and they were all, you know, it was very glamorous. And when I was five, they took my brother and I to see a musical, a new musical called Flahooly, which was a big flop, it turns out, which we, I didn't know what that was. But it starred a very young Barbara Cook, her Broadway debut, and life-size Bill Baird marionettes. And the attraction for my parents was that after the, the, the musical, they would let the kids go backstage and meet the puppets, which was wonderful. And so I actually remember meeting the puppets. I don't know what I thought they were, but I mean, I remember meeting life-size marionettes and thinking this was very cool. And then a few years later, they took us to see Peter Pan with Mary Martin and I was a goner. So that was my theater introduction. But and did you ever have any desire yourself to be on the stage? Sure, everybody does. But I mean, I was, you know, I was in all the plays in high school and all the plays in college. And I was, I have a master's degree in theater from Columbia. Um, and I, I always, I think I always knew that I wasn't good enough or tough enough to be an actor. And I really, I had no in, I didn't know anybody in the theater. I didn't have any connections at all. 
and I couldn't really imagine how I could be in the theater. It just wasn't, it wasn't in the realm of possibility. And, but I think I always had the press agent gene. I was always the one that would go out and beat the bushes for something. If we were putting on a play, I'd say, um, I used to do um, summer theater up in Westchester and I'd say, let's go down to the train station and, and sing as the people get off the train and then we could give out flyers. Yeah, I, you know, I had the gene. Mm -hmm. And so when I graduated from college, uh, I got a job at Lincoln Center Inc., which was the parent organization for Lincoln Center. It was the the over the, the umbrella organization. And I was so dumb, I didn't even know what the job was. I didn't even know what department it was. And it turned out it was working well, at- Back up for a moment, how did that job come about? Did you hear um, about it or were you called in? Or how did that happen? I can't remember, I didn't know anybody. Mm -hmm. I must have answered an ad or something. I don't know. I, I mean, I, I didn't know anybody at Lincoln Center or anything like that. So I, 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 I took this job and I had no intentions of staying. I had, they kept saying, well, now, are you going to stay because we don't want to train you? And I said, oh, of course I'm going to, I had no intentions of staying. I wanted to be in the theater. I didn't want to go work for this stodgy old place that was just opening up. I didn't know anything. And by accident, it turned out that I mean, I didn't even have secretarial skills. And, and this I wasn't even a secretary. I was an assistant because I didn't have secretarial skills. I mean, I had no skills except that I was bright and I could write, but nobody cared about that. Anyway, it turned out the man I worked for was a wonderful man named Jack Frizzell, who was the press director. It was an accident. I mean, I, I didn't even know what department it was. And Jack really, I guess he thought I was bright and capable and I learned and he helped me. He taught me. Mm -hmm. And after a year and a half, I was kind of this little golden girl. They all thought I was wonderful, but they were having a cutback. And so I was the first last one in. So I was going to be the first one out. And because they liked me and because I was the first one who was going to get cut, they felt guilty. And so because they all felt guilty, they helped me get another job. I always said if I'd been the third one fired, nobody would have lifted a finger. But because I was the first one who had to get fired, they and I wound up working for a theater press agent named Frank Goodman, who was a very big deal press agent, crazy, but very good press agent, who was the press agent for the music theater of Lincoln Center, which was run by Richard Rogers. And so I went from Lincoln Center to being a, an apprentice in a, in a press office, in a theater press office. Well, I want to go back a little bit further. <laughs> uh, when you uh, went and you... Uh, met, uh, and this is going to be a name that will throw a few people out there, Iggy Wolfington. And... Shapoopy. Yes, Shapoopy. Uh, I mean, most that people... That was in college. That was when I was at NYU. Exactly. I wanted to go back to that point because that was a, a turning point for you as well. It, it was, it, well, it was another example that I had that gene. I was in college and there was a play that was put on by the actor's studio that starred Julie Harris. I, I, what's the title of it? You know it, Richard. Um, um, it's right on the tip. Uh, it, was, it was about um, Gypsy Rose Lee's sister. It was about. Uh, yeah, she played June, June Havoc. Ha June Havoc. It was yes. about June Havoc. Anyway, it was it was about. Um, I get a moment. <laughs> I know it's in my book. Anyway, what happened was I went to see this play and I loved it and I decided to go back and see it again. And it, it's going to come. Marathon. 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 Yeah. Marathon Thirty Three. It was called. Yes. And it was about during the depression and the marathons. Okay. And it was wonderful. And Julie Harris just broke your heart. She was wonderful. And so I decided to go back and see it again. And I was at the box office and I was chatting with the box office treasurer. And I, and I was buying a, you know, single ticket up in the you know, standing room or something. And he said, um, I said, how's it doing? And he said, not very well. And I said, anything I can do? And he said, well, yeah, as a matter of fact, you should contact this guy and this guy was Iggy Wolfington, who was in the play and who I knew as the guy who sang Shapoopy in the Music Man originally, big heavy set mm -hmm. character actor, wonderful. And so I called him up and he said, We're having a, can you come up to my apartment? And my mother said, <laughs> Over my dead body. Yeah. And so I, I conned a friend to go with me because, you know, and Iggy Wolfington was the nicest human being alive, by the way. I mean, he couldn't have been nicer or less intimidating or threatening at, at you know, at any level. But 
I'm a nice Jewish girl and I have a mother, you know. <laughs> and you don't know, you're not going to some actor's apartment. Anyway, turned out Iggy was organizing a sort of parade, a publicity event. And so I joined this event and, you know, we gave out flyers in the street and I think they sang or something and we marched around and, you know, we probably extended the life of the play another, you know, minute and a half or something. But, you know, looking back, it was probably the first publicity event mm-hmm. um, that I participated in. And it was I, obviously I had that gene, mm-hmm. you know, Iggy Wolfington, bless his heart. Well, there are so many amazing stories uh, navigating through your career, um, and you go into great detail, and we're going to hit on, on a few of those. Uh, but uh, for everyone out there who have, haven't read the book yet, and you've got to get the book, um, how, uh, yes, how proactive um, do you feel that you have been in your career in terms of making things happen? And how many things do you think uh, that it progressed your career because you were at the right place at the right time? Both. I mean, no question that you have to be proactive in this business. Uh, you have to you have to make your luck. You have to put yourself in the right place at the right time, of course. Um, on the other hand, I got my first important job, which was which which led to me handling applause on Broadway. Um, which at that time was like Hamilton. I mean, it was a big deal Um, by being in the right place at the right time. And what happened was I had had a couple of little, couple of short lived press agent jobs. And and the problem with, with when you're a beginning press agent is you work on a show and if a show closes, you're out of a job. Most press offices don't have enough work to sustain keeping people on in between shows. They, the show closes. Thank you very much. Goodbye. So I had a few jobs. I'd had a, I'd worked a little bit as a press agent, but I, for some reason, I was going up to the drama bookshop to do so, to to get something. And in those days, it was in a uh, in a office building, a small office building, like on the fifth floor or something. Yes, I remember it very well. Right on Fifty Second Street. Yes. That building doesn't exist. It's gone. I think it's a hotel now or something. Um, in fact, I know it's a hotel now. Anyway, so I went in in the building, and the elevator stopped say on the third floor, it opened on another floor. And when the door opened, I saw a sign that said, Bill Dahl and Company. And because I was a theater kid who read what we call the back of the book, which is the production credits, I knew that Bill Dahl was a big press agent. So I got off the elevator, I went in, I said, can I leave a resume? Now, I don't know why I had a resume with me. I wasn't going on a job interview, I just had a resume, I don't know why. Anyway, they said, They took the resume and they looked at the resume and they said, can you wait a few minutes? I said, sure. I was, I was going to the drama bookshop. Where was I going? So they said, can you wait a few minutes? They came out and they said, Bill, Bill Dahl would like to meet you. Okay. I, I go back. I meet, they take me back to his office. I meet Bill Dahl. We chit chat for a while. And he says, can you start tomorrow? Now, luck. Absolutely. Being in the right place at the right time. Absolutely. On the other hand, I had, I, had, I had a resume. Why did I have a resume? And I had exactly what they were looking for. They wanted someone to do radio and television pitching on all their clients. And I had just had a job where I did all the radio and television pitching on all their clients in another press office. So luck. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because the door opened on the wrong floor. That's what happened. I didn't know they were in that building. You know, I had no idea. On the other hand, it was luck combined with, you know, having what they wanted. Preparation. Yes. So, yes. But I, but I mean, it is the ultimate being in the right place at the right time story. So I want to move forward uh, to, uh, uh, I'm sorry. The pages go this way now. Yes. Um, Lauren Bacall. Yes. And applause, because okay. that was another major turning point in your life. Well, what happened was, so I was 23 and I was working in Bill Dahl's office and he had lots of jazzy clients like Mike Todd, you know, mm-hmm. and Silly Putty, <laughs> had all, you know, the Moscow Circus. I mean, had all sorts of interesting and strange clients and it was really fun and uh, and hard work. And then along came this show called Applause, which was written for Lauren Bacall by her friends, Comden and Green. Uh, Adams and Strauss wrote the music, uh, directed by Ron Field. It was a big deal. 
and it was created around her. It was created mm -hmm. for her. And everybody in the office worked on it. We all, you know, went to rehearsals and we all pitched interviews and we all covered things. And, and as I said before, Betty did not suffer fools gladly. And she would say to one of the older, and I was the little kid in the office. I mean, I was very much the one that answered the phones and, and you know, um, and they liked me and they, you know, they trusted me, but I was still the kid in the office. And so they, she, Betty would ask one of the more senior press agents if something was done. And because they didn't really want to have a problem, they would say yes. And then Betty would find out it wasn't done and she would kill them. And I, on the other hand, with the innocence of youth and, and, and because I, I had no agenda, I wasn't being manipulative or anything. I just didn't know any better. Uh, she would ask me if something was done and I'd say, I don't know. I'll find out. And if it's not done, I'll take care of it. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I was just, I, I was just trying to keep my head above water. And one day I was called into the producer's office and I thought, Oh, what did I do? You know, am I going to get fired? What, you know? And they said, uh, Betty has just informed us that the only person she will talk to in the Bill Dahl office is Susan Shulman. <laughs> Did your heart roll? Just uh, roll I, roll I, roll? I, I was like, I mean, it was, it was ridiculous. You know, I mean, it should never have happened, truthfully. I mean, it should, you know, the, the powers that be shouldn't have let that happen. But, you know, she knew what she wanted. And she didn't trust them and she trusted me. And so she said, I I'll only talk to her. And so at the ripe old age of 23 or whatever I was, maybe 22, I wound up handling what became the biggest hit show on Broadway, you know, one old Tony's uh, and it was incredible, you know, and she was really, really, really kind to me. And I, I always had a theory that, Part of it was, I mean, she liked me and she knew I adored her and she knew I was very protective of her. But it was also that she, because I was such a little kid, that she knew that if she ever really gave it to me, I would crumble and then she'd have to cope with that, you know. So um, I think it was a combination of all those things. And also, I was a part of a very happy time in her life. I mean, Applause was a very happy company and everybody adored her. Later on, she was more difficult and she, there were lots of stories about bad behavior, but not during applause. She was- Did you ever work with her again after that? No, but interestingly, every single time I ever saw her, and, and I do this with everybody, I never, I never assume that somebody knows who I am because I know we all know a million people and it's very hard sometimes to put the name and the face, you know, to connect them instantly. And so anytime I meet anybody, I say, hi, I'm Susan Schulman. Susan L. Shulman. And so when I would see Betty, you know, after applause, after, you know, we'd all moved on, um, I would always say, hi, Betty, it's Susan Shulman. And she'd say, I know who the hell you are. And then she would give me a big hug and a kiss, you know, and she would like mock me because I felt the need to introduce myself. But I would never assume that, you know, she would pick my name out of the air. I, why would I assume that? But and this went on till quite late in her life where I would see her at something and I would always go over and say hello. And she would always say, I know who the hell you are. And then she would grab me and give me a big hug and a kiss. But it was a very happy time in her life. And of course, for me, it was like, you know, like I won the prize, you know. Well, did you feel at that moment that you had arrived, that this was, uh, you were definitely on the path that you were meant to be on. And from that experience, what do you think was the greatest lesson that you learned that has remained with you through the rest of your career? Well, certainly to be a straight shooter and to be honest and to tell the truth. I always say there's no show or client or job or anything that is worth me losing my credibility over. And so, you know, I'm, I think I'm, I'm known for somebody who has integrity and tells the truth. Mm -hmm. But um, I don't think I ever felt like, you know, I had it made ever. I don't think I feel that way now. I think, I think everything is, you know, those little, when we were kids, we had little white pads and yeah. you'd draw on them and then you'd peel it up and it would disappear. Mm -hmm. And I, I kind of feel that way every time a show closes, like we were starting from scratch, you know, I have to prove myself again. And, and I think everybody feels that way a little bit, you know, but shortly after that, you opened your own office and you've been there ever since. Am well, I yeah, yes, not, not immediately, but a couple of years later I did, yeah. 
and I opened, I had sort of worked my way through a variety of press agents that I had worked for over the years, including uh, the, the last one was Merle Dubusky, who was kind of the king of Broadway at the time. And, and I'd worked for Merle for about almost five years. And um, at that point, the Schuberts and some other sort of movers and shakers had said to me, you know, if you go out on your own, we'll give you shows. Mm -hmm. And uh, silly me, I believed them. <laughs> but um, some of them did. Uh, uh, so I, uh, I did go out on my own in, in the late 70s. And I was out on my own until the mid 80s when CBS, of all people, made me the offer you can't refuse. And they created a position. There are, uh, there are many series. That That's right. They created a position for me, which was really weird and wonderful. And um, I closed up my and office. There may be a few people out there who don't know what a mini series is or was, but they were very popular at that time. And they, they were this, was, this was in the mid 80s, and they were like over three or four nights. And I mean, I didn't work on this one, but like Shogun was a big one at the time. And but I, I worked on some really juicy ones like, and just the title alone tells you all you need to know. It was Joan Collins in Sins. Sins. <laughs> you don't need to know anything else. No, I said, that's it. And I, I said, I can sell that. <laughs> but I did Robert Kennedy in his Times and um, um, Space, which was spectacular. And so there were a lot of these. Anyway, I went to CBS. I hated every minute of it. And after nine months, I went back to the theater. Well, what was it? That no, I didn't go right back to it. I had other jobs, but. Well, I was gonna ask you, and you beat me to the punch on this, um, if the similarities were the same, but what was it that you hated about it? Uh, I didn't know what hit me. The, 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 the thing that I was impressed with with, C, with CBS, with the person that actually, they recruited me actually, they sought me out, which was unusual. Um, was that they under most people look at somebody's background and they only see that they, they only they think you can only do what you've done before. So all I had in my my resume was theater, and somebody at CBS understood that you I I could handle a project with a beginning, middle, and an end, and they they made that connection with the miniseries, and they they understood that the skills that I had from the theater could be translated to television. And I thought that was really very smart of them. What I didn't like was I'd never worked in a corporate situation. And at that time, CBS, which was the Tiffany Network, mm -hmm. um, was about as corporate as you could get. And I, and I was managing a department of about 30 people. And I didn't know what hit me. I mean, I just was um, in a very alien situation. And I didn't like it. I hated it, actually. And I, and I would would assign people to do all the things that I wanted, that I wished I was doing, that was the fun stuff, you mm -hmm. know, like being the, the the press rep on a particular show or series or something. And I was back in, in BlackRock doing fourth quarter marketing reviews and goals and strategies. And it wasn't, wasn't very fun or creative or interesting. I have so many questions and I'm seeing the clock <laughs> running out and it's driving me crazy. Um, I want to have you back for a part two. Uh, yeah, we've, we've. There's a wonderful, there's a wonderful cartoon that I, that I have actually posted on Facebook. It's a man asking Siri and he says, what is the weather? And Siri's response is, why, where do you think you're going? <laughs> Exactly. Well, I want to ask you, Isn't that perfect? Uh, but uh, there, I mean, every chapter, you know, is a different book. And there are a couple of uh, chapters that I want to focus on for a moment. Uh, but before we get there, because I don't want to run out of time, what has kept you in the game all these years? I love it. There's a, uh, people, people don't realize that press agents actually have a lot of creative input into a show. Um, sometimes it's more visible than other times. Mm -hmm. But we have a lot to do with how, with creating the right expectations, the right perception of a, of a project. Mm -hmm. And that can be fun, that can be challenging, it can be creative, sometimes it can be really annoying. But it's that's the part to me that's really interesting, to look at a project, figure out, who would be interested and, you know, who do we want to reach and how do we reach them? Mm -hmm. And that, that's very creative and that's fun. And to me, it's still challenging. So, so that part of it, 
I love is are there other parts of it that aren't so much fun? Of course, you know. And what do you think is the biggest misconception that people have about what you do? They think it's air. People don't know what a press, nobody knows what a press agent does. I always, I always, when I go out and do book talks and things, I say, well, some people think it's smiling and nodding at the critics. Hi, thanks for coming. Enjoy the show. Hi, thanks for coming. Enjoy the show. Hi, thanks for coming. And some people think it's, um, that th people don't know when you say to people, what are, people really don't know. And I always joke and say they think it's air because they think it just happens, you know, and if they could not pay for it, they'd like that better, even more, you know. But I always say to them, how did you hear about the show? And they say, oh, I don't know. Somebody told me it was good. And I said, well, can you be more specific? Can you think about where you heard about it? And they say, well, I think I heard it on the radio. Well, a press agent set that up. Um, I think I saw something in a column. Well, press agent did that. You know, I think I saw a picture. Press agent did that. Mm -hmm. You know, and you don't kind of put all those pieces together normally. Um, it's like posters. You know, I'm great friends with uh, Frank uh, uh, Verlizzo, who's known as Fravor, the, the graphic designer who's done, you know, every wonderful poster you've ever seen from Lion King to Sweeney Todd. And you, we'd say to people, where did you hear about the show? And nobody ever says the poster no. because they, they, they don't connect it. Well, that image was created by somebody. Now, the advertising agency, it was a combination of people. It could have been the producer's decision. It could have been a lot of people's decision. But the, the, the image of a show, if it's a really good image, just, you know, tells you something. It, it, it sends you a message somehow. And a press agent's involved with that as well sometimes. Now, I have a question for you, and it may be a loaded question, uh, but I came to New York in 1979. I came to New York at a time where New York had gone through like almost major bankruptcy and everything. Mm -hmm. There was the I Love New York campaign, which brought everyone back to New York and celebrating the theater and everything. And here we are now on the precipice of returning to the theater. Please. Uh, would you like that campaign? to get people oh, to come I, back to the theater? I think we need something. I think people have to see see it, you know, emotionally, see it visually, but see it emotionally. I think, you know, it was the same thing after 9-11. There was that fabulous commercial. And I was there the day they, they filmed that um, with everybody in the universe in it and every, uh, every cast member in full costume and, you know, the Lion King heads. And I mean, it was fabulous. And, uh, you know, you, you you see that commercial and your heart sings, you know, it was, I love New York, you know, it was the same thing, however many years later. So yes, I think we definitely need that. And right now, I think we need a little more leadership in the theater too, in terms of, of how this is going to end. Um, I mean, it may be that there's all kinds of negotiations going on that we don't know about. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's very possible that's what's going on. But if it is going on, it's all going on below the surface. And so people in the theater have no idea, um, you know, what what unions positions will be. And and obviously producers are going to want concessions. And obviously people will have to make concessions because everybody's hurting. But um, there have been there's already been some negotiations with the unions for the Met. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, the Met locked out the, the stagehands. How's that going to go? How do you anticipate? Of course, this is all speculation. You don't have the answers. But how do you see the theater coming back? I don't think it's going to come back till we're all we all have the vaccine. Mm -hmm. I mean, I there's nothing I would like more than to be sitting in a theater. But am I going to be comfortable? I'm not going to be comfortable sitting in a theater. I, I know they're making every effort. And I know there's going to be special, you know, cleanliness and all that. But you know, do you trust the person sitting next to you has been as diligent as you have been? Mm -hmm. It's very tough. Mm -hmm. So I don't think I really think. And, and also you can't come back. Uh, theater can't come back at 50 percent uh, audiences. No. It, it, financially, it can't. And um, and also it's going to take from from whenever we feel safe, it'll take at least three months. So, um, you, you know, realistically, what are we talking about? You know, probably 
2022, I hate to say it, but realistically, I don't think, I don't see how it could be. It takes at least three months just to rebuild um, awareness and audiences and advertising and go back into rehearsal and tech shows. And these are shows that already exist I'm talking about. You now, know, I hear it's, that- It's not a switch that you push it and it goes back up, you know. Uh, I hear that Hamilton's coming back on July 4th. Do you think that's uh, f feasible? I don't know. I mean, maybe. I, who knows? You know, I mean, I, it would be wonderful. But, now, what's uh, next for you, Susan? Hmm? What's next for you? I have no idea. Isn't that weird? I just, I've never been in that position before. Usually you've got projects, as I say, hovering, I, as I call them. But I don't know. I mean, I... I'm somebody that does have all my eggs in, you know, two or three baskets, not, you know, I can do other things. I can, I've done book publicity and stuff like that over the years, but, you know, theater and cabaret is primarily my livelihood and those don't exist right now. So I've been doing a lot of pro bono work. I've just done a, a the publicity for a, a, the Broadway Green Alliance did a benefit that aired last night on Playbill, which was terrific. And, and they raised a fair amount of money, which is wonderful. And and I did the publicity for that. And I'm doing publicity for Friend, who's got a new project called Bespoke Broadway. It's very clever. They're going to create special events, video events with Broadway stars. And they'll be tailored to a particular group or an organization or it could be a birthday party. It could be anything. Mm -hmm. and, and you can have whoever you want, not whoever you want, but whoever is in the the family of this, you know, particular producer, and they have uh, there's a video producer and a and a cabaret producer involved, and it I mean it's very clever, and it's called Bespoke Broadway, and it's just starting out, and I'm helping them out. So you know I've got things that I'm doing, but none of them are um, gainfully employed. Would that be the yes, uh, yeah? <laughs> well, as, you know, as my dear friend David Friedman says, I know David. We're all in this together, but we're not in the same boat. I love you more than you know. I want you to know that. And this book, I want to get it here, Backstage Pass to Broadway, is an incredible book. Uh, we are at the end of our show, believe it or not. Can I say something real quick about that? I would love to offer your friends and well, we get there, I want to say something and oh, then okay. hold on to that thought. Okay. Uh, because, uh, first of all, I want to thank everyone for coming to see the show. Um, if you enjoyed the show, and I hope you did, uh, and if you haven't done so already, please go to my website, richardskipper.com, sign my guest book with your thoughts about the show, because that helps to boost the show in other markets. I also want to let everyone know that tomorrow afternoon uh, at two o'clock, I am going to be uh, with Rita Harvey and Peter Danish. Huh. They have a CD out called Simple Prayers for Challenging Times. It's an incredible uh, CD, and I'm looking forward to talking to them tomorrow. Um, I also end every show by telling everyone to go out and do something nice for somebody else without expecting anything in return. And what I would like you all to do is go to your Facebook friends list, and the first name that pops up on your uh, feed, I want you to order two copies of this book. <laughs> I want you to order one copy for yourself. And then I want to give, uh, and I want you to send one, if you're able to do so, to the first name that pops up in your feed. Uh, and we'll get this book out to as many people as possible. Now I'm going to come back to you. Okay. Yeah. What I wanted to say was any friend of Richard's is a friend of mine. Thank you. So the book is obviously available at, on Amazon and all that. But if you are interested in buying the book and if you would like me to sign it or inscribe it or inscribe it to a friend or do any of those things, I would be thrilled to do it at a vastly less lower price. So if, which would be 20 bucks, and that would include uh, postage and handling and me signing it and doing whatever you want, which is much less than it would be on Amazon and you don't get it signed. So if anybody is interested, email me. That's the easiest way at S-L-S-P-R. Like S is in Susan, L is in Linda, S is in Susan, P is in Peter, R is in Richard at AOL.com. 
email me, say you're interested in the book, and we'll go from there, and I'll tell you how we can do or it. Or send it to Richard at richardskipper.com, and I will forward them on to Susan. Perfect. So, Perfect. You know, uh, both ways. Um, and if we and don't I, ask, it could be a Christmas present. Absolutely. And we have not even scratched the surface. Uh, because, I mean, Zero Mistel, David Merrick, uh, <laughs> Warren, uh, there are so many stories in this book. You have to read it. It's incredible. We, we could go through the posters. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, uh, and, you know, talk about, uh, you know, David Merrick and uh, State Fair, the new musical. Great stories there. The new Rodgers and Hammerstein musical. Yes. Uh, but I'm going to turn the... Um, the stage over to you right now, Susan. I want to give you the final word. Anything you want to talk about, about anything that we talked about that you want to expound upon, or anything that we didn't talk about that you wish we had, or any message that you just want to put out to everyone at this time. And again, thank you for being you because you are, you're the real thing and I love you. Oh, thank you, Richard. The, the feeling is mutual. I, I think that the some, somebody once said, you shouldn't be in the theater unless you can't stand to not be in the theater. And that's true of me too. I mean, as I said before, inside, I'm still that kid who stood outside stage doors and wanted to tell people they enhanced my life. I, that hasn't changed. I, the, the exterior might be a, a little bit cooler and a little bit more professional, but, but inside, I'm still that kid. And, and I, I'm still astounded that I can walk into a stage door and that somebody will say, hello, Susan. I'm as surprised as anybody else. I mean, oh, no. <laughs> Susan L. Susan L. <laughs> and I, I mean, you know, I always wanted to be in the theater. I never thought there was a way in for me. And the fact that I discovered there was a way in that I, that I did have a saleable skill that people wanted, you know, I could write, I could think, you know, <laughs> I knew about the theater, but you know, that to me was a, was a real, a miracle and a gift. And so I am still as thrilled to be in the theater as I was when I first started. And I think that's in a way the, the key to longevity and to, you know, hanging, hanging in when it's tough. And when, you know, those hills and valleys we're we're all in a valley right now, but we can get out of this eventually. So, I mean, I think it's, it's, you know, it's like what I did for love, you know, it, it really is. And so I know that's true of you. And I think that's true of most people that are in the theater, that we are doing it because we can't stand not to do it. Amen. Thank you. Love you. Thank you. Love you too. Happy holidays, everybody. Happy holidays.